monopod? Uh, no, actually. I've got a monopod. I've got yeah, a tripod out there. It's uh, my wooden one. I don't have a good one yet. Okay, okay. am I on? All right, you're on. Hit it. I, I need a long beard and a corn cob pipe, and uh, I was born in 1784. Oh, come on, Joe. George Washington was my godfather. <laughs> no, okay, got to be serious, huh? Born in... Uh, born at a very young age. 1932 in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. My parents were in Bayonne, but I... I was born in, Bay in Jersey City. I ought to be there by mother. Can I tell corny jokes? That's about it. Oh, corny. absolutely. Corny jokes are required. Were you born in a hospital? Yeah. <coughs> St. Elizabeth's, I think. I don't know if there was a, Bay a, a hospital in Bayonne then. I don't know why there. And uh, this was in the middle of the Depression. My dad worked for Western Electric, which made parts for Bell Telephone. I'm not sure what he did. And he was going to night school. I don't know. I think after they were married, he would take a bus or whatever public transportation needed and went to Brooklyn. Oh, what's the name of that uh, tech school? It's a well, well known technical school <coughs> that I should know in, in Brooklyn. He was studying mechanical engineering. And then he couldn't do that after he lost his job. And he had a chance to come up to Pennsylvania and help somebody build a chicken coop on another another place. And someone told me there's one in this place called the shopping. A chicken farm for sale. So he looked at it, went back to talk to my mother, and they came up and looked at it and they bought it. I don't know if they've ever seen a live chicken before this. <coughs> and uh, it was pretty rough growing. But then my dad, and I was nine months old when they moved there. Is this the sort of thing you want? Yes. Yep. yep. And my dad uh, got a job, got his job back in Bayonne or New Jersey, and he did with his mother during the week and came home on weekends. <coughs> and I remember going to Scranton to the train station once or twice to pick him up. And then he finally got a job around 1938, 39, in Wilkesboro, uh, Kingston actually. And the war was looming, and he got a job as a pattern maker. That was his trade. He went to a trade school, and they made it was Vulcan iron rakes. They made locomotives, iron uh, steam engine locomotives. And you ask the average person what a pattern maker what it does, and nobody knows. They're not very common anymore. There was a fellow in the camera club was a pattern maker. I think he worked mostly in plastics. But anyway, my dad took me to where they worked one time, and here was this big wooden locomotive wheel that they made. And that's the pattern. And they would put that in sand and pack it real tight and then pour the molten metal in there, and that would form the wheel. So he was a pattern maker using wood to make the pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did that all through the war <coughs> and up until the early 50s. And then he would get laid off and then come back again, get, get hired back again. It was a lot of fluctuation there. Do you remember the company in Wilkes-Barre? Vulcan Ironworks. Vulcan yeah. Ironworks, okay. Yeah, I, think so in, uh, <coughs> I think that's where I always was. It was like Kingston, I believe, which is a little suburb of Wilkes-Barre. So, once he moved to the farm, he always had to have another job. He did, yeah. And and for quite a while, yeah. And but they uh, but they still ran the farm. Still ran the farm. Uh, when he first went back to my own work, my uncle Stanley, who was my mother's younger brother, came on the farm and helped live there with my mother. <coughs> and looking back at it, you know that was been pretty tough for her, a city girl. Moving way out there in the dirt road, that farmhouse and so on. So, why did they buy the farm there? You told you said that they did, but why did they? Uh, probably, well, you know, people were desperate; had to do something. Why didn't they just stay in Bayonne, though? He did have a job. Oh, okay. But he he got a job in Bayonne. But then he Bayonne did, yeah, they, they wanted to keep the farm. My mother okay. told me, and this was after my dad died. <laughs> that he never liked the city, he always wanted to live in the country. 
And when they were dating, he'd talk about moving to the country. Mm. He always wanted to do that. I'm not sure why. He'd like to, you know, this is my place. It's, it's kind of an ownership thing, I think, pride of ownership. Mm -hmm. Because in Bayonne, they always rented, rented apartments. And here he had his own place that he could do with it what he wanted to. I think that's a big part of it. That's so he, he was a dreamer and dreamed? That was a part of me, too. Uh, we were married. Your mother and I, 13 years, I think, before we bought the place in Beaver Falls where you grew up. <coughs> and uh, that's the first house we ever owned. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, where were we? And where I did you all live hmm? in those 13 years before you bought a house? Where did you live? Oh, all over. <coughs> tell tell oh, the kids okay. where you lived. All right, we got married. All right, we got married November. And then I had to go back to college. And uh, your mother lived with the bank house, her parents. There's a, there's a bedroom upstairs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you got married while you were still in college? Yeah. So you had to go back, yeah, and she didn't go back with you? Mm -hmm. She stayed home with her family. And we were talking about this the other night about cars. And when we were kids, you know, teenagers, we probably could identify all the cars on the road because there aren't that many. Yeah. But there was a very strong, uh, what's the phrase I want to use? Loyalty to a particular brand. My dad was a Ford man. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you had Chevy, well, that's too bad. <laughs> and in the shopping, there was a Dodge dealer. Well, that's, uh, that's just too bad he had to buy a Dodge. And for most people, or working people, they had either Ford or Chevy <coughs> or Plymouth or Dodge, the lowest cars. And uh, in the shop, the priest had a Buick because there's a Buick dealer in Scranton, I guess, that gave discounts to priests. And there are a couple of businessmen, maybe a banker, who had a Buick. Or they were considered wealthy cars, weren't they? They were considered they? wealthy, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the working people had the, the lowest smaller. Anyway. Uh, we got married, we had a typical three-day Polish-Slovak wedding. Mm -hmm. you ever heard, you, you know, so, it's common, but Friday, we both had relatives from about far out of town, so Fridays people start coming in, mm -hmm. you know, to our house and to Anna Mae's, your mother's house, their relatives, and you break out the booze, you break out the food, and they start partying then. Saturday was the wedding, food there all the evening. And then Sunday you go back there and what's left over in the way of food and booze, if you can still stand it, <laughs> you finish it up or do something with it and go home. So really it, expand, it uh, covered three days. <coughs> but we got a lot of gifts and we got $700 in cash. Wow. Now this, this really is one of the purposes of a, these long weddings, I think, to get the newly married couple something to start out with. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people seem to live longer to, the, uh, to wait longer before they get married. They've got jobs, both have jobs and so on. But things were different then. So people were foolish, they got married, didn't have anything. You got your start from your wedding. Yeah, that was a start. Yeah. And we had $700 in cash, which was a lot. <coughs> mm -hmm. And we talked about buying a car. Let me get a sip of this out here and I talk here. This one's making me talk so much. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I just get a little. And this is the first uh, ale or beer that you've drank, had to drink in about five years or so? Oh, probably longer than that, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, so I had a course in accounting. It was small sections, maybe 25, 30 people, but there must have been 100 or more students. So they would give tests on Saturdays because I could get the same test to all the, to the, you know, just made one test for the, all the groups of small individuals got together. And I would get, uh, normally I could get a ride home on a Friday and get a ride back with somebody. People would uh, charge you a couple of bucks if they were in the car. But I couldn't get anything on Saturday. So I went shopping for a car. Uh, and I found a two-door 1947 Chevy. And I talked to your mother, I think, and I bought it. I wanted to get home for that weekend. I was in love. I was in lust. 
This this was in in state college. Yeah, you That's were right. in lust and you were in love. <coughs> yeah, yeah. And I, this was in the <coughs> state college. I bought it. How much was it? Ah, uh, I think around six hundred dollars, maybe. Because hmm. I had, had that money, and I brought it home. <coughs> My dad saw it, and he had to run it up and drive it, and oh, he could find everything wrong with that. And I realized even then that part of the reason is that it was the first big purchase I made, his son made, his only mm -hmm. son, and didn't consult him. Mm. Didn't talk to him at all about buying a car. That was part of it. And he could hear so many things wrong with the engine. So he was pretty upset about that. Did the car work out? Well, okay, so, let me continue. Okay. Uh, this, was, uh, this, was, this was right in January, I guess. And then I had about a week off between semesters, depending on your final exam schedule. Mm -hmm. There was time off during semesters. My dad was still working, and he had his <coughs> 49, 51 Ford, I guess. Yeah, 51 Ford. And one time it wouldn't start him. So he asked if he could borrow my car to get to work. I said, sure. And he borrowed it back, and he had to admit that it was a pretty good car. It had a lot of pep to it. Moved right along. <coughs> So after that, uh, the story was okay. So did you did you normally talk with your dad about buying about things that you did or buying things or decisions like that? Was that no. the first time you didn't? Or? Not much at all. <laughs> really? But normally like we go? did in our day. If we were going to do something big, we would talk with our parents. <laughs> I didn't. I don't recall doing anything. Well, that was a big thing, yeah. Uh, not normally, but if it was something special, then yeah. They, well, they wanted to help, and I, you know, my dad didn't talk as, as much as I did about really <coughs> and so on. And uh, one time he moved, so maybe they had to go to the service. He moved someplace, and I asked him about some question about installing the washer. And his friend, I don't know if you ever met Bob Roberts. Yes. Okay, that was yeah. one of his best friends, and he did this sort of thing. Part of his job, he worked for a feed mill where they sold these things. So my dad had to call him up on the uh, telephone and ask him about all this. And I heard him tell uh, Bob, he said, I may have to go down with him. You know, it was a pretty simple question. You know, you put this bolt here, you put it there, something like that. And yet he felt he had to give me a do all this for me. And to me, that was uh, rather. You took it personally, didn't you? Took it personally, yeah, I can handle this. <coughs> You know, I've moved a couple times, I've done this sort of thing, it's just a simple question. Uh, so that, you know, that kind of bothered me a little bit that he had to tell his friend he may have to go down to Port Matilda, wherever he lived. Oh, to, to help you, to help even me. though you were calling, you were calling on the phone about it? That's the question I had, I yeah. did it right away. <clears throat> yeah, it bothered you because you wanted to be independent and mm -hmm. grow into things, and he probably felt obligated because he was a father and had to... Yeah. Make sure things are done right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, what else do you want to know about? So, back to um, back to growing up there. So you talked about your dad was working through the through the through the war years. So basically, he always had a job outside the farm, and you kept most the farm. Of, most of the time, yeah. <clears throat> After about oh, I don't know, fifty-one, fifty-two. <laughs> Maybe before that, it might be on and off sometimes, depending on how busy they were. He was one of the first ones to get laid off because they knew he had another source of income he had to farm. Uh, mm -hmm. so there were times, I think, when they worked half days and Saturdays were half days. Was it much income on the farm? Was it? I don't know. I yeah. don't think so. Yeah. You know, they, and I, I've thought about this ever since, not ever since, but years later, I guess. I was supposed to go back. I took poultry husbandry. A lot of people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. I have to have two degrees to be a chicken farm manager, basically. <coughs> and uh, I don't know anything about their finances. The finances family farm. I don't know anything about the breeding program. Uh, you know, he kept a lot of records and we used to trap nest chickens. And what you do, the, the nest had a <coughs> door when the chicken went in it, the door fell down, you caught it there. And if I laid an egg, and the chicken came out, you caught it, and it had a band around its leg. And you'd, the number, you'd mark that number on the chart, so you had a record of 
how much the chicken was laying. Mm -hmm. You know, you use this as part of your breeding program. They never told me much of this. In fact, they didn't learn much of it in college either. And this, this is something he should have been. You know, if I if I had gone back there, I would have been a hired man. That's what happened. As soon as I got out of college, I got a notice from the draft board. It was one A. One A is. Oh, you're ready, ready to be drafted. <coughs> and, uh, so Wait, which was what, what year? This is 54. 54 out of college. My mother was pregnant. No, we're living in <coughs> her folks. And my folks said they could hire me maybe $35 a week or something to see what happened with the draft. And uh, I was just a hired man. <coughs> you know, I kind of resented it after four years of college. And my dad was still working. And then there was a new dentist in town. He told me to check out the Coast Guard. And uh, I did. And I thought, if I get drafted, I'm going to be in the service for two years, probably, overseas. I'll never see my family. And maybe if I joined the Coast Guard, I'd have a better chance of uh, seeing them. And as it turned out, it did. And <coughs> my dad was upset with that. I joined the Coast Guard. Why? Because he didn't know, I'd be gone for four years, I would be back on the farm. Uh -huh. But once I got out of boot camp, you know, I got I got transferred to an air base in Michigan, and I didn't even know the Coast Guard had airplanes uh -huh. until then. And your mother came out, uh, both of your grandmothers and baby Joey drove that same Chevy out there, and they uh, brought out uh, and your mother and the baby and Joey with them. And uh, then they took a bus back. Same Chevy, you mean the Chevy that you had bought? Yeah. In college, they drove it all out? Mm -hmm. So is that the. There's one picture we have all four grandparents, my four, all four grandparents. Yeah, that and was, was that the trip? Out they came out, they traveled together. That was the trip, or was that it a separate? City, yeah. Well, okay. With, with mom and the baby, and yeah. Joey. Baby Joey. So, let me back up a little bit more. Why did you go into poultry husbandry? Well, Why'd you take that? I don't know. My dad, my dad wanted me to go to Penn State because he used to go there for meetings. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, kind of a, you know, there, there weren't many other options. It's, it, it didn't, there was no uh, tuition at the time. i get to that later. And then that year, our brooder house burned. If you remember the brick building yeah. is, and there's a... Uh, the foundation. The foundation there. Yeah, I remember the stories. It was wood. And the other part was a two-story cinder block that we had built. Mm -hmm. And it caught on fire where the wooden part joined the new building. Uh, because the chickens were all down at the other end. Mm -hmm. They were all dead. You could smell dead chicken, burning <coughs> chickens. And my folks had paid off the mortgage. That was a big thing. You know, and I learned in college, uh, farming is a business and you borrow money as long as you have a plan to pay it off, just like other businesses borrow money to keep on going. I'm sure you know about this, Bill. And but uh, they had to re remortgage the farm. Because and of the fire? Because of the fire. Okay. The Valentine's Day, 1950. There's a lot of snow on the ground. <coughs> the fire truck from the shopping didn't come up. The one from Mahopany, which is further away, did. Because it was too late, they couldn't do anything. It was all like I still hear my mother saying, Oh, Joe, the Bruder house is on fire. The what? Uh, she said, Oh, Joe, the Bruder house is on fire. This was through about 6.30 in the morning or something. It was so dark out. And I looked, I could see flames going <coughs> through the window, the shadows of the flames in the house. We all ran out. And Johnny Griffith, our neighbor, ran over. He saw the fire, but there's not much anybody could do. So this is the season when you start to grow baby chicks and they had no place to grow them. <coughs> so what we did was took the uh, shelters. Do you remember the A-shaped buildings mm -hmm. out there where we kept them out on range? Yes. Mm -hmm. We took those, put them on the foundation, and closed that somehow. Mm. We raised them in there, and the mortality was pretty high, but uh, did that, and then that summer we built the, another chicken house. But I saw how hard my folks worked. I saw my dad cry when the building burned. 
Joe, well, what, how, how does this tie in with what you chose to do in college? That's so what you were on. So I decided to go into poetry husbandry and go back to my folks. Part of it because I felt sorry for them in a way or something. Or I, there was a loyalty here and there, I don't know. Did your dad want you to? Did he, he said you can take what you want, but of course he wanted me to. You know, mm -hmm. That's what he always talked about. To. And ever since I can remember, he talked to me about going to college. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. And there were 90, 25 kids in my graduating high school class. I was there and went to college. Uh, at, right, right from high school. I think there were a couple. Well, Hal went to college later on, Hal Greaves. And I think another one became a nurse. <coughs> That's about all I know about them. Uh, yeah. But it was because of the fire and all the work involved yeah, that you it. decided to get into it? Yeah, I, I felt that loyalty. <clears throat> felt loyalty. I guess, yeah. Uh, hey, the new Bruder house that was built, was that the building that was just beyond the uh, the center block building? That was when you right next came to in it. on the left hand <laughs> side, wasn't it? But the Bruder house burned. Yeah, the Bruder house burned, but the center block building was. It had burned. Uh, there was just one end of it up, of the original building. Yeah. The end, you know, down toward Mishapin. Toward Mishapin was the end that burned? Yeah. Oh, I thought no, it was... No, it started where the two buildings joined. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was an electrical fire, pretty sure of that. And another interesting thing, one of my dad's best friends was an electrician. He taught electricity at a, in a uh, vocational school in Bayonne. He helped my dad lay out the wiring and everything. Mm -hmm. No, I can't say he did something wrong. We just, you know, we just don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. But because it started there, and the chickens were all at the other end, makes you wonder. It makes you think that's where the, that's where there was a, a fuse box. I think it's an electrical panel or something. Okay, so the center block building that existed when when we would go visit there, that's the new Bruder house. That was the new Bruder house that was built. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> gotcha. Mm -hmm. What else? <coughs> All right, talking about cars. Uh, my dad bought a Ford 39 station wagon. I know, yeah, 39. And uh, I remember looking at it. He drove it home from, he was still working at Bayonne. He drove it home on the weekend, I remember, looking out my uh, bathroom window, my bedroom window, and seeing it. And I think it was painted green. He had it painted blue. I don't know why. <laughs> didn't hate the color, I guess. And it's what they now call a woody. The wood panel? Because it's all wooden except the fenders and the hood. Mm -hmm. The chassis is wooden. And uh, <coughs> it was big. And then he drove that all through the war years. He had to be at work at 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, he had a gas heater put in. The regular heater was enough, and he had a uh, like a, almost like a pull, it pulled down like a movie screen, a shade sort of thing, just a little window that he could put behind the driver's seat to keep the heat in, mm -hmm. or he could move it behind the passenger seat. There's just one passenger seat, and there was room behind that for storage and carrying things. And uh, that's how I learned to drive. I was about 13. That that big station wagon? A big station wagon. That was yeah. they they were big. They yeah. still are, but they were big. And uh, I'd like to see one someplace there. They have a lot of car shows around too, so I'd like to see one right now. Hmm. Bring back memories. Call talk to Jim Click. He probably could get you one or let you see one. Yeah. And uh, I learned to drive that. We had to. Uh, for a long time, twice a year, he had to simonize it. And simonize is, you wash it down first, and you put the simonize on. And you rub like heck. And you wait a few seconds, and you got to rub it. If you wait too long, it's too dry. You can't get it off. Mm -hmm. If you don't wait long enough, it's too moist. So you had to time it just about right. And then you rub and rub and rub it. But boy, you got a beautiful shine on it. Mm -hmm. And that kept it up. And you had that job, right? Hmm? And you had that job? 
yeah, to wax it? Yeah, you always do it, but uh, my dad would start it and then he had something else to do and he <laughs> Since I ended up doing most of it by myself. Bless you, oh, bless you. Me. Bless you. And thank and, uh, you. So I drove, I learned to drive that, and I couldn't drive, just up and down the road, or the road. <laughs> and uh, once in a while I went over to, just, gotta sneeze again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Went over to Burr's, remember the poetry farm across yeah. the highway, mm -hmm. like across the highway there. And uh, one time I, I, I was driving, after, after I had my license, and I was going down the back road, but Uncle Stanley was with me. I don't know if you're going to town to get something the farmer walk. And if you could call that curvy road going down into the shop and by mm -hmm. the skinny firehouse. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the building then was a hospital. So there was originally a hotel that was converted to a hospital. Mm -hmm. That's where Joe was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, the brakes went out. Oh, boy. I said, the brakes are gone. And Michael said, the brakes, the brakes. I said, they don't work. Now, what he meant to say was the emergency brake. Now they're called a parking brake. Then they're emergency brake, which was a cable, right now, uh, a hydraulic system, as it was. Mm -hmm. And I'm too nervous and excited, I guess, to think to pull that up. I'm using both hands to steer. We came down there, and we bumped against the curb right by the hospital emergency room. Mm -hmm. And that stopped us. Oh my gosh, did it, did it, did it break something on the car? It, it yeah, break so the I drove to a gas station nearby, and uh, I knew the Swisher's gas station, and I knew that there was a kid working there, a year or two, I had him in school. And uh, he got underneath it, you know, and he showed me that there was a cable that sprung a leak, the hydraulic, and, uh -huh. and now they have separate systems that run in front rear brakes, so they still have some brakes. And you guys weren't hurt in that? When, well, and, and when you bumped into the... No, it didn't curb. hurt. <laughs> but it's just uh, ironic that he landed right in front of the uh, emergency, room. emergency room door. Mm -hmm. So... <coughs> <coughs> so your father taught you and everything that you needed to do around the farm, just basically, like I mean, driving and all the things about chicken. chicken yeah, well, chicken. Now, after you got a car, he got a 49 Ford, or oh, he's a Ford man. Yeah. And then in 51, he traded that in. He was, he was working steadily then in Wilkes-Barre. And he, was, he said there's something about the economy, car prices are going to go up. I think he was doing pretty well financially. He just wanted an excuse to buy the car. Mm -hmm. But he got a 51 Ford, which wasn't that much different from the 49. Uh, and he had that for a long time. What was the most valuable thing that you that you learned from your father? From the farm? From your father. Uh, hmm, I think a sense of, of fairness and uh, basically he's a kind person. He would talk all the talk constantly when he was with his friend friends from Bayonne would talk, but other than that he wasn't really an outgoing person. Yet he was involved in the church quite a bit. Uh, so yeah, just, I think kind of a sense of fairness. Uh, which doesn't exist in the world. Yeah, it does. Uh, well, on, on the family, friend, level it does. But you ask the politics going on and all the things, what's happening to the middle class now? It's disappearing, all that. Uh, did did Grandpa... A lot about working around, you know, mechanical things, woodworking, so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did he touch you those things? Uh, no, we, get, we have a plumber who comes. He's a very good plumber, doesn't charge much. And he uses a a branch which has teeth on it, it's adjustable. I used to call, they used to call them water pumps or something. Mm -hmm. And he used that on a nut which has square sides on it. Mm -hmm. And if I did that and I was a kid, my father would chew me out. Because if you do that, you got to rub off the quarters of the you strip nut. It. Mm -hmm. You know, you should use a, a wrench, a regular wrench or a, mm -hmm. 
pipe wrench just over there. Oh, I'll take a monkey wrench. Yeah, uh, more pipe well, wrench. Well, anyway, the right kind of wrench you put around there. Mm -hmm. A crescent and, wrench, maybe. And then this, yeah. And this guy was a plumber, and he always used the wrong wrench, as I see it. But my dad was very fussy about tools. Mm -hmm. Tools are important. And do we get a bathroom back here in this production? <laughs> yeah. No, we and have to go you, for three and hours. And after you come back, we'll see about sitting down to dinner, okay? Not okay. me, Bill. Not you? Not my hair. My wig's not on. Well, I have to get you if you're talking now. Okay. <laughs>